Okay, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Marvin Lawrence to come up on stage. Uh, Marvin is another one of our students. Uh, he's a student here at the Seminole campus, and he is going to introduce our next keynote speaker. Uh, Marvin is a biology major, um, and he's a member of the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, and uh, also a member of our uh, Men Achieving Excellence um, uh, Club. And uh, ultimately, he will become an anesthesiologist. So I just want to hand it over to Marvin. <clears throat> I aced my uh, speech class, but I never thought I was using it in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon. My name is Marvin Lawrence. Uh, and you know, biology is my major. I love science. Uh, STEM, yeah, that's, uh, that's the key to life. Um, I'll be introducing the keynote speaker, Dr. Sanford Trigard, and I'm going to read this little intro they gave me. Yes, bear with me. <laughs> um, Dr. Sanford, uh, Sandy Trigard has served since 2000, 2000 as the fourth president of Valencia College in Greater Orlando, Florida. As winner of the first Aspen Prize for Excellence, Valencia is one of the most celebrated community colleges in America. Serving some 70,000 students per year, that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> 70,000 students per year, Valencia is known for high, high rates of graduation, transfer, and job placement, and has become something of a national lab laboratory, laboratory for best practices in learning centered education. That's, it's really good. <laughs> Prior to Valencia, Dr. Shugart served as president of North Harris College and as vice president and chief academic officer of the North Carolina Community College System. In 2015, he, has named, he was named by Washington Monthly Magazine as one of the 10 most innovative um, college and university president in America. He earned his PhD in teaching and learning from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In addition to his career in, a, in education, Dr. Shugard is a published poet, musician, and songwriter, and author of leadership in the crucible of work, discovering the interior life of an authentic leader. Please welcome <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. We just panicked the AV staff. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're going to record this, I think, in a few minutes, and it takes them a, a little bit to get this set up. So I have to have a long warm up. <laughs> I'm do a little. Thank you for being here. Uh, here it is, late in the afternoon. Um, you've learned more than a human being was meant to learn in uh, one day. Um, I hope you remember some of it. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm delighted that you're here, and it'll be my honor to spend a few minutes with you. And my hope is to have conversation in the last few minutes of this, um, and I think we can get there. I do warn you, there is a video at the end before the conversation, um, and it runs about six minutes. But I just couldn't tell the story better than the person in the story tells it himself. So if you'll let me share that, uh, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so let me understand who we are before we get started. Uh, how many of you are St. Pete people? We just love you guys. So <laughs> thank you for being here. Um, uh, what, uh, not all from this campus, I gather. You came from all over? Hmm. Well, it's good to see you here. And how many of you are from outside of Florida? Also a big group. Awesome. Wonderful. Good to see you here. Well, um, I am... Uh, I'm from just up the road. It's uh, Orlando and Tampa are growing towards each other every minute. There is a sign about halfway in between that says, Welcome to Tamplando. <laughs> it's uh, urbanization of Central Florida, and, uh, and I'm a part of that. And we think of you as our next door neighbor, although we have to pass Hillsborough to get here. We still think of you as our next door neighbor. Tell me when you're ready. Close? Yes, but uh, I've been instructed never to tell them <laughs> by my wife. <laughs> we, 
Well, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my college, and then we'll, we'll get into this. So I have been at Orlando, uh, at, at Valencia, for 18 years. I never planned to be anywhere that long, uh, except with Jane. And uh, we uh, spent eight years in Houston, and before that, eight years as the vice president of the community college system in North Carolina. Um, it has been a wonderful experience uh, to be in Florida. I uh, didn't plan to come here. Uh, I've worked in Texas and Florida the last two stops, and frankly, neither Texas nor Florida were in the top 48 states I thought I might want to live in someday, <laughs> being a mountain person. But we ended up loving them both, and uh, we, we just adore our time here. We have an unusual system in Florida. Uh, it was founded a little differently. Uh, Florida, Florida was settled a little differently, wasn't it? And it affects almost all of our public policy, and including the way that education is structured here. Florida was essentially an impenetrable swamp. In fact, I drive through the green swamp to get here. Uh, several years ago, the swamp caught on fire. We had muck fires, this was 10, 12 years ago, and you couldn't travel between Tampa and Orlando because the, the smoke was so thick it took months for them to put it out. It's a strange place, Florida. But the central part of the state was, was uh, settled quite late. And the edges uh, you know, were sort of where Florida developed. So Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Jacksonville and St. Pete were the older communities. That's why you have the oldest community college or college now in the, uh, with origins as a junior college. Uh, when was St. When was Pete founded? 1920s. This is your 90th year? Wow. We thought we were old at 50. You guys are ancient. Um, and uh, the way it was founded means that there weren't all these pilgrims in the wilderness, in their errand on the wilderness, in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, founding multiple colleges everywhere they went, like you find in Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York and New England, and even as far south as Virginia and North Carolina. If you came to a, an urban area like this, in the rest of the country, there'd be 50 colleges. They'd all be tiny, but there'd be 50 of them. And what you'd have is an environment where no matter what you needed as a student, there'd be some college out there that fit you. They're all in different niches. And so they have the luxury of saying, well, this is who we are. We're in this niche. This is what we do. This is all we do. We couldn't do that here. We have to serve everybody because it's only us. In Orlando, there's the University of Central Florida, the second largest public university in the country, and Valencia, and our neighbor Seminole, and one independent college, Rollins. Rollins serves about 3,000 students. We serve 70,000. I think UCF serves about 68,000. There's nobody else to do this work. So we have to figure out how to be distinctive and universal in all that we do. So some of what you're going to see in our, in our work here speaks to that. The way we relate to one another in the ecosystem is different, for example. Um, but I think it points to the future. So when we get to that, I'm going to bring that up again. I think I've stalled long enough. And if you'll let me, I'm going to read a poem at the beginning, and then I'm going to reread the poem at the end. Will you let me do that? It takes twice with poetry because we're not used to listening to it, unless it's set to music. And I didn't bring my guitar. So this is a poem called The Singing Bowl. The Singing Bowl. You know what a singing bowl is? The Tibetan prayer bowls, right? It's called the singing bowl. Begin the song exactly where you are. Remain within the world of which you're made. Call nothing common in the earth or air. Accept it all and let it be for good. Start with the very breath you breathe in now. This moment's pulse, this rhythm in your blood. And listen to it, ringing soft and low. Stay with the music, words will come in time. Slow down your breathing, keep it deep and slow. Become an open singing bowl whose chime is richness rising out of emptiness and timelessness resounding in time. 
and when the heart is full of quietness, begin the song exactly where you are. My friend Malcolm Geit wrote that poem. The work you've been discussing for the last day or two, and the work that you have put your shoulder into back at your institution is so worth doing. And it's immensely complex and full of technical detail. And the systems we work in are immensely complex and full of technical detail and individuation. And our temptation is to think about them at the aggregate. Students as populations, or types, or categories, or God help us, FTE. Okay. Categories of employees that we refer to in broad statements. But the truth is, we're engaged in eminently human work, which is to say, collaboration at scale among unique beings. Every student, every person, unique. It's the gift of humanity. The capacity to, to collaborate at scale is unlike any other species, even other human species. Sometime in the last 100,000 years, in the early part of that, there were four modern human species. Do you know their names? We are Homo sapiens. The next most effective was Homo neanderthalensis. And the other two I don't remember because they were tiny. <laughs> and they were limited to island cultures where they, in, they speciated in isolation. When Homo sapiens engaged each of them. They were extinct within a few years. There's a little bit of mitochondrial evidence that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens uh, interrelated, but not much. Neanderthals were wiped out. Now, we're having to rewrite everything about Neanderthals. We have this image of the heavy-browed, knuckle-driving, mouth-breathing NFL football player, right? <laughs> They, they really weren't like that at all. Their brain capacity was equal to ours, and they were able to work with fire every day, work with tools, all the things we do. But we outcompeted them. They were actually, as a group, stronger than we, more robust, but we outcompeted them. And the reason we outcompeted them, and I see an anthropologist in the room, the reason we outcompeted them was the development of a capacity to collaborate that has to do with what is called effective language. The ability to conceptualize and articulate things that don't actually exist. Like, gee fellas, I know the way we hunt mastodons is with spears running among them trying to stab them in the belly but Thag got stumped to death last time. And it occurred to me that if we could find a box canyon somewhere and just kind of herd them into it, we could drop rocks on their heads from up above and no one would have to die. What do you think? That's effective language. That's saying, I can imagine a circumstance I've never seen. That's a story. It's a story. I'm going to tell a story. And it's the capacity to story that allows us to collaborate together. We used to wonder how in the world did a pharaoh get thousands of people to labor for generations to build a tomb? And the answer is not just power, but the power of story. Pharaoh was a god. That was the story. We have collaborations we can't explain yet. They're going to come back to story. Gobekli Tepe in eastern uh, Turkey is that way. It pushes the clock back 8,000 years earlier than we thought anyone could produce a complex civilization. And here's this amazing temple complex 
with gorgeous carvings of both real and mythical beasts intentionally buried in the sand in eastern Turkey. What is that about? I don't know. But the answer is going to be about a story. So I'm going to tell you a story today. And the story is going to end with a story, too. Because it's only story, not facts, that move human beings to work. So one more, one more anthropological conversation here. You do understand that we are utterly irrational until after we've made a decision, right? That everything we do, everything is emotion followed by an explanation carefully worked out by our brain. That's the way human beings work. That also has immense adaptive advantages. Because if you had to s work out logically every time you saw a saber-toothed tiger crouching on a rock that you might be the intended victim and it could be time to run, you're already dead. But if you immediately have the fear response and take off running, the guy next to you who's thinking about it is going to be dead. <laughs> and in that way, your genes get passed on to the next generation. You see how that works? So, so uh, later we'll talk about data, right? But, but, and forgive me all my statistician buddies, your job isn't to persuade us with data. You can't. But your data sometimes can tell a story, okay? That's where we're going to go here in a few minutes. So let me start with this. We have been working so hard at this. Valencia started in 2000, really in 1996, with this question. Is this as good as our students can do? Can they not do better than this? And the answer was, yes, we think they can. We're sure they can. So what have we got to change? That's the story. That's the beginning of the story. Many others are in that conversation, a lot more than we're then. I've never been more encouraged by where our movement is than I am today. There was a time when we went to conferences about helping students learn, and we were all alone. There were lots of people talking about how to improve the institution, how to strengthen teaching, how to find our place at the table with those institutions that get all the money and prestige. There were very few people talking about learning. And now it's everywhere. There are dozens and dozens, scores of institutions, whole systems that are wrestling with this. And they're implementing all sorts of stuff. You are too. Guided pathways and pervasive uh, advising and uh, you name it. All sorts of things. Could you make a list? I'm happy to say I could make a list of best practices now just from my memory that's longer than any of the stuff we do. Could you make that list? It's, it's worth knowing those things. It's helpful. But here's the stick in the mud. Despite now a decade or more, in our case, a decade and a half, of serious effort, the progress has been modest, generally. Across the country, really scary. So the lift among the institutions, let's, let's just say the, the hundred that are working the hardest at this, the lift is there, but it's a few percentage points on every measure. Not a lot. So our outcomes have improved, but not dramatically, not a quantum level improvement like we've hoped. And for those when you average it across all institutions, those that care and those that are still obsessed with other things, the outcomes are kind of flat. Now, you know, there are lots of problems with every measure. This is just one of them. But there's nothing to be encouraged about here, is there? So I ask the question, what does it take to achieve quantum level improvements, dramatic improvements across the institution in student learning and completion. Those are the core of the mission. There are other missions that matter too, but this is the core. Student learning and student success, student progress towards goals, student credentialing to the goals that they want to achieve. How do we get that instead of just 
incremental improvements of a couple of percent here, a couple of percent there. Things that are encouraging early in the work, but after 15 years you say, really? How do you get from the bottom curve to the top curve? Because the bottom curve is the most optimistic des description of what we're doing now as a movement. The top curve's not been achieved as a movement. How do we do that? So my story has five, a fab five, building blocks. I could have invented seven. I could have done four. I don't know why I did five. I think it was, the, 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 these are the five that came to mind as the strongest ideas. And sooner or later, you're going to go to sleep. So these are the five that I think I want to focus on for you. S strategy, culture, ecosystem, anthropology, and story. I'm going to walk you through these quickly, then we're going to talk. First, strategy. So how do you develop strategy? I want to teach you the only thing I know. So don't tell anybody this or I won't get another consulting job. How do you get good strategy? Strategy really does matter. Strategy in the classroom matters. What's your strategy? Strategy matters at the departmental level, certainly matters at the institutional level. What are we trying to get done and how are we trying to get it done? Just having one is nice, but it's got to be the right one. It's got to be a good strategy. What makes a strategy a good strategy? Think of World War II. Where are historians? Anybody? Any historians? Oh, they're all reading right now. Okay. So think of World War II. What was America's strategy in World War II? George Marshall's overriding umbrella strategy for America and the Allies in World War II. Win the war in Europe first, then win the war in the Pacific. That was his strategy. It was important. He was the only one in the senior command who thought that was a good idea. Fortunately, he was the senior commander. Now think about it. No one in Europe had attacked us. Japan had attacked us. No one was worried about an invasion in Virginia. But the West Coast was being armed for the imminent invasion by the Japanese. Why on earth would you put all your resources into Europe? Hmm? That's one reason. That's a good reason. They had war material production. I think... If you read Marshall, there are multiple reasons. Everything's overdetermined. Uh, but the core of the matter is he got it right. Imagine what would happen if we'd done it the other way, done the natural thing. Hmm? You would have had Britain overwhelmed. That would have given the Nazis time to develop the V-2 rocket and a nuclear warhead, and everything would have been different. Everything. Everything. It's a good thing he had the right strategy, isn't it? So where does the right strategy come from? Well, here's where we usually go. This is the classic model. Um, those of you who've done strategic planning remember doing this. Have everybody done this at some point? Yeah, yeah. You start with your mission, vision, and values. You rewrite those for the ninth time. And, and you have very virulent arguments about it, and they don't matter. Um, and... and uh, Unless, as I heard in an earlier presentation, the students are involved, then there's some, some chance that it might actually matter. Okay? But you write those, and then you develop strategies, and you figure out your goals, and you develop tactics to implement those goals. You might have measures and outcomes and all that sort of stuff, but you sort of move from the base of the pyramid to the top, right? Classic strategic planning. The problem is, how do you get from mission, vision, and values to strategies. How do you move there? Where does a good strategy come from? Is, do you just have to have one inspired person who says, I've got it, Eureka. I figured it out. Is it the first person that speaks? Is it the most powerful person in the room who speaks? Or is everybody taking that person's temperature to find out what the next strategy is going to be? Where does it come from? Well, I think this is the answer.
Strategy isn't built on mission and vision and values. It's built on a working theory, a theory of reality, a theory that's informed by all sorts of data and information. It's a working theory. What's happening in the world? And therefore, given our mission, vision, and values, what should we do about it? That's where strategy comes from. I have a friend uh, back in Orlando who's an incredibly successful businessman. He, he started with a $15,000 credit card loan and built a $27 billion REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. He's brilliant. He's a good guy really good guy. And we talk about this all the time. So an example I might share is I will go up to Jim and say, Jim, what are you working, what's your latest working strategy, working theory, excuse me. And he'll say, okay, here's one. Water will be scarce. Okay. That's an interesting working theory. Water is going to be scarce. And he didn't invent that out of his head. He reads everything. He talks to everybody. He's got research teams. And they have discerned this is going to be one of the major issues of the next century, scarcity of water. Okay? Now, he's in the real estate business. That's his mission, vision, and value stuff is all real estate stuff. So what kind of strategy might address water shortages? Well, for one thing, if you own a lot of real estate in dry places like Arizona or western Colorado, you might want to unload them. If you own ski resorts, and his read at one time owned half of all the ski resorts in America, you might want to think about whether there's going to be enough water to make snow. Okay. So they unloaded all their ski resorts, sold them all. See what I mean? It, the strategy has roots in a working theory. We just call these big ideas. That water will be scarce and that we ought to do something about it is a big idea. What's yours? If I asked you, what's your institution's big idea? One or two or three things that you guys talk about, think about, test all of your ideas against, what would it be? This is the reaction I usually get. What's your idea? Historically, in community colleges, the big idea was Give them a chance. Let them in. Give them a chance. We call it access. That's pretty much it. That's been the big idea for 50, 60 years. Eh, give them a chance. We've had many iterations of it. Back in the 60s and 70s, it was called right to fail. Give them a chance. When people raised questions about ability to benefit, we said, eh, give them a chance. Access. Is that the only idea we have? Get deeper into your institution. As a teacher, what are your working theories about your students? How do they learn? Right? What are they here for? How can they change the conditions under which they learn? Because they control more of them than we do. And what can we do to change the conditions to support their learning better? What are your working theories about that? This is the conversation that leads to good strategy. Most people throw a strategy on the wall and spend the rest of the energy figuring it out, figuring out what to do about it. You really need to spend most of your energy on the working theory. The strategy gets easy then. And when you have consensus around a working theory, which is kind of a principle, you can have all kinds of disagreements about what to do about it, and their productive disagreements. That's real brainstorming. That's not just a mess. So here are a few of ours. These have been around for years, some of them. We're still building on them. The first one we call is one of the earliest ones we developed, Start Right. I'll tell you more about that one in a minute. It just, it just means that most of the failure is somewhere close to the front door, and students who don't start the right way are highly unlikely to finish. Right? Second one up there was connection and direction. Our students, at the time we hatched that, we, we, we had deep conversations like this one here with our students, with all kinds of students, and found out they really want a connection and don't know how to make it here. And we've made a provision for it. We're treating them like we were a shopping mall, letting them wander through and 
buy a product here and a product there, and maybe they'll fulfill their Christmas list. No direction, no connection. And when we tested it, it seemed to work. What we call the P's. Uh, it used to be the five P's, and it was the six P's. Now, I don't know how many there are, so I just call it the P's. Every student needs... This is based on deep research with them. Every student needs these P's. They need a place. Do I belong here? They need a um, purpose. Why am I here? They need a pathway. If this is why you're here, here's the path that will take you where you want to go. They need a plan. That's how they make the pathway their own. They need unique preparation for that pathway. They're not all the same. They don't come with the same preparedness. And they need a person to connect to. Those are our six Ps. Your ideas might be different from ours. Your theories might be different from ours. That's fine, but you've got to have them. We've done many of these. Let me just walk you through an example of one. So here's Start Right. We were able to discover in the data that the best predictor of graduation at our college was success on first attempt in the first five classes. It didn't matter what the classes were. As long as it didn't matter whether you took them all in one term or over multiple terms. If you succeeded on first attempt in your first five classes, you were going to graduate. So here's the actual data updated through fall of 12 because these are cohorts and the outcomes come later, right? So this is the, the, the term in which they started. So what this says is that about half of our students, yes, about half our students succeed in their first five classes on first attempt. About a quarter of them succeed in four of the five. And the rest succeed in three or fewer, Okay. Half, get them all right. A quarter, get them three out of four, or four out of five, excuse me. The rest, three or less. Here are the consequences of that. If you succeed the first five, your fall to fall retention, that is first fall to second fall, is over 85%. That's extraordinary. If you withdraw or fail in at least one, or make a D in at least one, it drops to 73. Two, it drops to 57. Three, so you're only succeeding in two now, 34%. That's pretty dramatic. That seemed to confirm the theory a little bit. Here's fall to second spring. Again, this is getting close to graduation. 80% retention for those who succeeded in their first five classes. 66 and four of the five about half and three of the five. So the ones, that, the ones that withdrew or didn't succeed in two aren't write-offs. Half of them still make it to the second spring. But boy, it's a big gap between 48 and 82, isn't there? And here's the five-year graduation rate. If you succeed in your first five, it's 60%. Anybody interested in having a 60% success rate at graduation? If you withdraw or make a D or an F in one class of the first five, it drops about in half. In two, it drops to one in five. That's stunning, isn't it? That's a working theory. Now, this doesn't solve anything. It just get, it confirms our working theory. And now we've got to say, okay, what does it mean? And we have, have many debates about this and continue to. What's causality? What's correlation? What are the alterable variables? If we get success, if we could move somebody from one of those bottom lines to the top line in their first five classes, does the success cascade through the rest of their program? These are testable things. They're subject to verification. And we've done all that work. I'm not recommending you that this is exactly what you need to do, but I'm trying to give you an illustration of how this notion of developing strategy is really real. This is concrete, hard, data-entrenched work, but the data don't tell you what to do. They just point you in the right direction for the right conversation. 
and then you go test and try, test and try, in a model that allows you, when you discover what really does work, to scale it. Make sense? Any questions about this one? All right, first building block then is strategy. Well, a lot of people are doing pretty good strategy now. But as several people have been credited with saying, I think it was actually a healthcare reformer said it, culture eats strategy for lunch. If the culture's not right, the strategy doesn't actually succeed. So, what about culture? What do we mean by culture? What's the culture at your college? What culture do your students experience? What culture does your college build on? What makes you a coherent community? So how do you know? How would you discern the culture at your college? Well, if you were, if you were an anthropologist, anthropologist again, dropped into your, your college to study it, one of those invisible participant observers, the first thing you'd want to look at is artifacts, because culture is always made in the artifacts. We don't look at artifacts just because that's all that's left over in archaeology. We look at artifacts in living cultures, too. And the artifacts reveal everything. When I came to Valencia, I was trying to figure this stuff out. And I had my suspicions. But one of the questions I asked several people, particularly my institutional research person was, what report do you produce that is the most valued report by people deep in the college? The report that they call you about, is it ready yet? The report they argue with about, this can't be right. You know what the answer was? Yeah, the instructional productivity report. Enrollment, average class size, ratios of full-time to part-time, and any outliers on the, on the low side for enrollment. Really want to know where those nine-person classes were. Right? Interesting. What does that tell you about the culture of my college when I arrived there? What did they care about? Enrollment and money, they're inextricably connected, aren't they? Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with enrollment, and there's nothing wrong with money. But our mission wasn't to produce enrollment or a budget. Our mission was to produce competent learners, wasn't it? People that go make a life for themselves. What did we have in the reporting system to measure that, I asked. Well, we're pretty advanced here. We've got cohort studies on graduation rates for, gosh, going back to the early 1990s. We've been doing it for years. I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. It was spring. I forbid you to produce the IPR, instructional. You may not produce it. When people call, say, we're not doing it this year. Right? And I forbid you to produce the graduation report. If anybody calls, you tell them, we're not doing it this year, and we'll talk later. Okay? This set off a huge ripple through the organization. There was a black market in enrollment information. <laughs> Deans were calling in the middle of the night. I know we're not supposed to, but you can tell me. Okay. Go back to the IR guy and say, so what happened? He said, they are just about killed me to get the IPR. I said, how many threatened your life over graduation? Nobody even called. You see, this is culture. Now, you had a great conversation earlier in a breakout session on shifting the culture. I don't need to go into depth in that. I just want to tell you that as you work through this, you've got to figure out how to change culture together. And culture is pervasive. Culture isn't something that's set from the top. Culture emerges from the middle. It's shared. Everybody contributes. It's a collaborative project culture. So. If this is your culture, how do you move that towards something else? Again, nothing wrong with enrollment. It's a business outcome. It's, it's kind of a sort of a measure of access, not a very good one. 
unless you go deep in it, look at who the enrollment is. But mostly it's a business outcome. And, you know, you have to have business outcomes to underwrite the mission. But it's not the mission. What do you do? How do you overthrow this kind of dominant culture and create in its place a culture that respects the value of enrollment but is focused on the outcomes that you're after, the real mission? That's a really important building block. And let me tell you, that can happen in one classroom, in one division or department, on one campus, or across the whole organization. You'd be amazed at the power you have to change culture in your group. Humans are groupies. Groupies. We love tribe. And we subdivide and subdivide and subdivide our tribes. You know what the natural maximum limit is for a human tribe? About 150 people. It's very hard to have meaningful social engagements beyond about 150 people. Right? So who are your 150? What do you talk about? What stories do you tell? What jokes do you tell? Jokes are great culture makers. What artifacts are you producing? What behavior do you honor and reward and call out? Okay. At the board level, you know, I'm looking at the artifacts on the board agenda. What does the board agenda tell the college we care about? Is the first thing on the agenda the enrollment report, and then the budget report, and then the building report, and then the HR report, and then we have a nice student say a few words and we're done? Or are they having deep conversation at the board level about how well are we achieving the mission and how do we care about that mission, learning and success and completion? In my, in my case, I discovered a fringe group, about 100 people, who had been gathering for several years on soft money away from the central office to talk about learning. It was a lovely aberrant culture. And the, and the line culture, straight from the president through the deans, was productivity. Growth good, spending bad. Okay? And so I knew what my job was, that I had to enlist the help of innumerable people of common cause and concern to move the fringe culture into the center of the college and displace the old culture. You don't just kill it, you have to displace it. Right? Something to think about. <clears throat> so, what would you do? This is different, by the way, at every level of the organization. When you as faculty peers meet, what's on the table? What's the topic of discussion? What data are you sharing and stories you're sharing with each other? When you're doing it dean to dean, what's going on? President to president or vice president to vice president. I hate going to meetings. I don't go to any national meetings. I'm sorry, I just can't. I cannot stand in the hall anymore and listen to my colleagues say, my FT is bigger than your FT. <laughs> I can't do it. Or worse, when I go to the larger higher education meetings, my average SAT is higher than your average SAT. Oh my God. So, here's a question. Next, building block, ecosystem. You see, we think there's, there's hardly anything in the world more self-absorbed than a college or a university. We really think we're important. We're sure everybody should love us and give us all their children and all their money because we're awesome. And we navel gaze with the best of them. Now, I'm in the community college world and have remained in the community college world because we're the least that way. There's hope for us. <laughs> there is. There's no hope in some kinds of institutions. I gave up on it. You can, you know, maybe manage the edges a little bit, but there's not going to be transformation of this kind of culture in most of our major institutions. They're too far gone. They're too old. They're too ossified. They've been possessed of the madness of athletics and money and and other things, endowments and so on. You know, to be kind to my sisters and brothers in, in the, the sort of elite university world, they were selected, trained, and rewarded 
for one thing, building. Build this institution. Take it to the next level. Build the enrollment. Build the buildings. Build the athletic program. Build the endowment. Build the brand. No one says, why? I just got a call from, from my alma mater. I love my alma mater. They didn't love me that well, but I still love them. Okay? And basketball season starts this weekend, and the University of North Carolina is going to win it all. I just know they are. Okay? Did last year. Okay? Love them. They called one to know if I was going to be a part in the next $2 billion campaign. Now, I'm not a, a large enough donor to get an important call. I, got, I get like an undergraduate calls me. <laughs> And I said, honey, thanks. You've done a super job. You're so poor. Tell me about your major. We had our talk. And I said, thanks. Uh, you can mark me down as a no. Why? And I said, well, it's not important, really. It's just not the right time for me. Why? I said, you really want to know why? She said, yeah. I said, get your supervisor on the phone. Okay. Got the supervisor now. I said, tell me about yourself. She, she told me right. I said, you want to know why? She said, yeah, we well, have to write it down. I said, you write this down. My beloved alma mater is not raising money because they need to. They're raising money because they can. And I don't care about your scorecard. And you shouldn't either. No. The only illusion I had after this was that they wouldn't call back. <laughs> they will. Okay? They will. But that kind of self-absorption has led us to, to function in silos. And as you heard in earlier sessions, one of the most important questions we have to ask isn't how we're doing, what are we experiencing, what's the college experience, it's what are they experiencing, right? The only adequate definition of the college is this. The college is what the students experience, period. It's how they experience us that counts, not how we experience them. But all of our culture is built around how we experience them. Just a small example. People talk in our world mostly about sections, not students. We measure section success rates, section dropout rates. We measure workloads in sections. We even talk about them. Got any good sections this year? How's that section doing? Uh, students aren't sections. They experience us as individual persons in a room of other individual persons with one individual person of enormous power to them in the room with them. That's what they're experiencing. And most of our thinking forgets all that. You just heard it, didn't you? Aren't they wonderful? They'll tell us what we need to know. We just have to listen. And they experience us as part of a much larger ecosystem of institutions. As much as these four full-time students, pretty much, fairly traditional students, student government, student athletics, okay? But for every one of them, there's three here that aren't traditional at all, right? That aren't going to do athletics, that aren't going to be an SGA, because they got three mouths to feed and just got divorced and two jobs, and they're coming and going and patching it together. And, and you know what? They're experiencing other institutions at the same time prior to, after, back and forth, we live in a larger ecosystem. And most of the dreams you even heard from this group cannot be achieved here. They can only be begun here. Other institutions are going to have to contribute to their dreams, aren't they? That's the ecosystem. Now, back to Florida. We have a weird ecosystem, don't we? We just talked about that. So our ecosystem is Valencia, UCF, and a few other little things. That's the ecosystem for 2.5 million people in central Florida. That's it. A few go to, you know, for-profit things, bless their hearts. A few go to the tech centers, like 1.9% of the graduates. Here's our numbers. 
when kids graduate from high school, part of the ecosystem, if they go to college anywhere in Orange or Osceola counties, where we are, two out of three come to Valencia. One in six goes to some state university, and one in six goes to some other kind of institution. And half of those who go to a state university go to UCF directly. And that number's declining, as you'll see. So we took on this ecosystem question and said, let's look at the whole pathway before they get here, after they leave here, and everything in between. So what do they experience? And what value proposition do we make to them? Okay. Around the country, community colleges get beat up really badly for having low graduation rates. This is called conflation of data. When you deconflate the data and say, in what are they not graduating? The answer isn't nursing. We have pretty high graduation rates in nursing, don't we? Any nurses here? Pretty high graduation rates. I mean, you know, you wear them out pretty hard, so a few are going to fall along. They say nurses eat their young. I know that's not true, but, <laughs> that, but a few fall away. But really, if they get through nursing two, they're going to graduate, aren't they? They're going to graduate. Nursing one, nursing two, a few, few fall away. So it's not nursing. What is it where we have really low graduation rates? Two areas. One is those who go to work prematurely because we've over-designed and over-engineered programs that don't need to be as long as we've described. They could be unbundled and stacked and done other things. You can't do that in nursing because the only meaningful outcome in a nursing program is completion. That's why they complete. Does that sound obvious? No one comes to nursing and says, I just want to take a few courses so I can take care of my father-in-law. <laughs> Nobody does that. <laughs> right? they got to complete or it's meaningless. Okay? We have the opposite of that in our largest program, Associate of Arts. The opposite. The state that has the lowest completion rates in the Associate of Arts program is, anybody know? Texas. Texas. I have a friend in Texas. He was a brand new chancellor of Austin Community College. Good friend. He had only been on the job a few weeks when he was driving into central Austin. He saw a big billboard put up by some concerned businessmen's group that said, Austin Community College graduation rate, 2%. Is this a good use of taxpayer dollars? This business guy had put up seven of them around the city. My, my friend was wise. He went to see him face on. He called me ahead of time and said, what's going on here? I said, I'll get back to you. So I called him back and said, okay, because I had worked in Texas. I kind of knew how it worked. I said, I just went to the websites of every college within 30 miles of Austin Community College and looked for transfer. And about a half of them, there's no mention of transfer students. But in the half that do... Almost all of them actively discourage students from doing anything anywhere close to an AA degree before they transfer. They tell them on the front end, take 15 hours or less. That's your best bet. And the students are doing exactly what the ecosystem tells them to do. System performing as designed. We just didn't know that the other part of the ecosystem had designed it differently than we had. Make sense? So what are we going to do about that? We created a thing called Direct Connect in Central Florida. Direct Connect is a different value proposition. Oh, no, it's sideways. Well, I'm a really good PowerPointer. <laughs> we, we got together with the university. And the university was wanting to become more exclusive and selective in their freshman class. They need to fill dormitories. Local kids don't go there. They wanted more, you know, on the pecking order. That stuff matters to them. But in order to do that, they've got to cut themselves off from the local community. We said, I have a way for you not to do that. Because if you do that, we're going to have to start 40 bachelor's degrees like that crazy St. Pete College. <laughs> they said, well, uh, tell us more. And I said, we need to change the value proposition to our students. And we had a long talk. And their president came back. He's a great guy. He came back and said, 
I, I have a proposal for you. What if we guaranteed every student who earned a degree at your institution admission into our university? No questions asked. No other filters. No GPA limits. No nothing. If you've got a 1986 tattered diploma from Valencia, you are admitted, period. Now, they're in the top 200 most selective universities in the country now. It's all supply and demand, right? You understand how that works? Selective means you got a lot of demand. Okay. And they do. Again, that crazy ecosystem. Lots of demand. So they're raising entrance requirements. Their, in, their average now is 4.0. In, in 1999, 73% of applicants got into UCF. Now it's 40. That's more selective on the numbers than UF. Mm -hmm. So this was quite an offer on his part. But we had the data that showed clearly that students who transferred with an Associate of Arts degree graduated sooner and in higher numbers than those who transferred with just a bunch of credit, even if it was a lot of credit. The completion of the degree was, was highly associated with the completion of the next degree. Okay? So they were in. We signed an agreement that has six or seven other pieces about joining joint degree programs and joint facilities and things like this building and so on. But the core of the matter was a new value proposition to students that said there's a reason for you to earn an Associate of Arts degree for the first time in history. There isn't anywhere else in the country. Not really. There's direct connect light in a bunch of places. They've tried to do it, but the universities wouldn't go all the way. Yes, for these programs, but not for those programs. Yes, for students who have this GPA. Yes, but no. And the students aren't interested in a nuanced offer because they've had those all their lives every time they turned on the media. That guy with the fast voice, blah, 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 blah. not true in New Jersey, blah, blah, blah. Right? So they're deeply cynical about these half guarantees. It has to be plain and simple. Guaranteed you're in. This is what happened to our degree production. So on the left is the first year of Direct Connect. I think that's right. No, Direct Connect started in 2005, 6, and 6, 7. That's right in the middle of that graph. The red line is a growth in... Um, AS degrees, so we were growing and we were producing more degrees over that time. The blue line is, or excuse me, the green line is growth in certificates. We've really doubled down on shortening programs and building stackable credentials, and that grew even more. The blue line is Associate of Arts degrees. In four years, the number of degrees produced doubled because people had a reason to graduate. This is rationalizing the ecosystem. And your strategies, if you're going to be successful, have to include that with USF and others wherever you may be. Hmm? So here is beyond us. So if you're serious about the ecosystem, one of the things you accept responsibility for is how your students perform at the next level. So here's those numbers. And what's happened really since fall 2006 is the number of Valencia transfers who have enrolled at UCF has doubled from about 5,600 to 11,300. And the percentage of their undergraduate population made up of our transfers has grown from 23% to 26%. Their native students is now is down from 57% to about 45%. We're overwhelming them. We love it. It's the Chinese method of world domination. You know, we're just sort of outproduce. And this is the degrees granted to our transfers after they've gone to UCF. And that grew from 1,600 to 3,100. So everything's pretty much doubled in the same time. And you would expect them to, to increase kind of in kind if you're being successful there. You see the picture? So one of the building blocks really is this whole notion of dealing in the whole ecosystem. I didn't even go into the K-12 world. Others have done that better than we have. I don't think we're exceptionally good. We're doing some things. We have some people that we co-employ who live, who report to us, really, because we give them attention. 
but live in the schools. And they're treated as guidance counselors without an assignment. They create their own work. Uh, and so they're doing all kinds of amazing things to encourage more kids to, to plan earlier and prepare better and aspire higher and all those sorts of things. But I don't think we're, uh, you know, a paragon of virtue in that area. I think we've cracked the code better than anybody else on the university side. Uh, by the way, you have to be able to make a, a value proposition to the university to pull this off too. Why would they want to do this? Okay. So we allowed them to have a super exclusive selective freshman class and not make the whole town mad. That's an important thing because everybody who lives in these selective university towns hates their university because they can't get in. Anybody here grow up in Gainesville? Right. You might be a sports fan, but you really hate the university at heart because they hated you. Right. So the next one is anthropology, next building block. So often I'll have this conversation with the faculty, and it's my favorite conversation with them. Once we've sort of had a glass of wine or two, we'll sit in my living room and I'll say, every pedagogy implies an anthropology. What's yours? They'll look at me funny. And I'll say, you see, if you haven't thought deeply about what it means to be human, what it means to be a human adult, and what it means to be a human adult learner, then your practice as a teacher, your pedagogy is ungrounded. You're knocking off a set of procedures someone else developed. You're a Jiffy Loop tech. Then we laugh. They know I don't mean that. But that's the, that's the, the risk is to become a proceduralist. And nobody wants to be that. A real professional. You know, the Jiffy Lube guy can't diagnose your car. He just, he has a checklist he goes through. Oil in, air pressure in, whatever. If the thing's missing a beat and you say, well, you know, what do you think's going on there? He'll say, I don't know. I, you know. I just change the oil. That's what I do. I just, I just read my lectures. That's what I do. This is, this is really engaging because it's also true that every policy, every procedure, every system, every habit that the rest of the college, including moi, regularly employs, implies a pedagogy, an, an anthropology. What's mine? What's yours? Hmm? These are really powerful conversations, I think, and have mostly to do um, with taking what we know about learning and testing our policies and our procedures against them. And this is a part of that culture formation. So early in our work, and we still do this some, particularly when we're bored, we said, okay, let's, let's write down the things that we think are most important for students learning. We name them. And then we go first. I'd say, okay, you tell me, faculty, what are the 10 dumbest things this college does to your students that we know is bad for their learning, but we do it anyway? Tell me. And we have list after list after list after list of stupid, boneheaded, idiotic, bureaucratic procedures that undermine learning, big ones and little ones. They're everywhere. You could do the same thing in a hospital. What are the boneheaded things we do as a hospital that aren't good for patients, but we do them anyway? And most of the time, if you trace it down and say, and why are we doing that? Why are we doing that? People would say, well, we have to do that because of this and because of that. And why because of this? Because of enrollment. At the base of it was, if we don't do it this way, we might not have all the enrollment we need, which is all the enrollment in the world, because that's the only amount that's enough. Got to have that enrollment. And we said, you know, I'm okay if we aren't the fastest growing college on earth. In fact, Growing really fast is hard and difficult and costly and creates strains and drags our quality down. I'm okay if we grow slow. You know, there are times when you, you step up, like in the recession. There are times when you step up, like when you've got 3,000 Puerto Rican kids coming to you in January because they, they can't continue their education. We step up. But on the whole, 2 or 3% a year is wonderful. 
One's tolerable. Seven's awful. You can do it a year, maybe two. Then you just, you're just buried with, with costs you can't afford. Okay? So I just helped him understand as a business, I don't, I don't, all growth isn't good. So we've, we started sorting out at the administrative level first, what do we need to change in our anthropology? How do we change how we treat students and reshape the student experience? And the faculty were more than willing to do that as well. And they really drive the process for us. We're wonderful partners in that work because they care more than almost anybody that the persons we call students are treated well. Last building block is story. Back to story again. So, you see how using data isn't just isn't cut and dried. You see how I told a story with the data? The data themselves don't tell you anything. It's the data with interpretation, usually hammered out among a bunch of people, making meaning of the data that matters. And, and at the end of the day, stories are what are powerful. This wasn't the student panel powerful? That was a way of accessing their stories. There are other ways. How many of you have a regular discipline of focus groups with students. How many of you, despite whatever the student feedback on instruction process and form is, get really meaningful feedback from your students on how the class works for you? Uh, we, we spent lots and lots of time um, with Tom D'Angelo and, and Pat Cross and others early on learning classroom assessment techniques. And you could tell everybody had been trained because they all had these index cards in their pockets all the time, doing quick checks with their students. How's this working for you? Little technologies, not big technologies. You, know, you don't have to have a learning platform to find out if a student's in trouble. You know all those techniques. What was the main idea in this, in this class meeting? What are the three things that, that you're going to remember? You know, um, th those kinds of, you're getting constant feedback, that conversation that you have with students. But there's also the big story. So um, uh, you guys are doing here at St. Pete some in interesting work in identifying communities of poverty and focusing your attention on them. I think that's really interesting. And at the end, when you tell that story, you shouldn't tell it with demographics only. You need people from those communities to tell that story because this is where the, our emotions work. So I'm a brain scientist by training. I'm a, a cognitive uh, scientist by training. And I will tell you again, the way the brain works, the first thing that happens is your brain comes to attention. You know what causes that? The amygdala. It's this little organ in the middle of the brain. And if it gets stimulated, it kind of squeezes out this crazy cocktail of chemicals. I'm a chemist. That's my part of the work. Things like serotonin and things, wonderful drugs. And the drugs tell all the neurons, something's about to happen. Pay attention. And that cocktail lasts for about nine minutes. And then it's all gone. It's absorbed back in the system. That's on average. Some people it's 12, some people it's two, but on average it's about nine minutes. This is why, why something has to cause your amygdala to sit up and take notice about every eight or 10 minutes in a class or you're gonna go to sleep. You can, and, and this is one of the most powerful ways, by the way, a story. Any story. A joke works. A story works. Music, moving around. There are all sorts of things you can do that say, wake up, neurons. But uh, here's the other thing you have to know. The way the brain works is that your essential belief systems are incredibly rigid. The brain's a conserving kind of organ. And once the, the pathways are established, it doesn't want to change them. It's very inefficient to change them doesn't want to change them. But there's something that causes plasticity in the brain, allows it to change its neural networks, and it almost always is caused by serious emotional experiences. Years ago, I used to teach um, ropes course stuff, okay? you team building and all that sort of stuff. There's only one idea in that whole thing. All that we did in ropes, all over the country. There's only one idea. The idea is this. Evoke strong emotion in people and then suggest different ways of believing. 
That's what you do in a ropes course. And it just happens that the easiest emotion to evoke is fear of heights. You've seen babies in the crib. They have that falling thing. Any of y'all still have the falling dream? Yeah, sometimes. That's a basic human thing. And it's really easy to trigger it. So they use the ropes course to get people in that frame of mind that is plastic. And then you suggest different beliefs that they can accomplish something, that some obstacle is really not that high, that we can get along. That, I mean, there's all sorts of things you can suggest. That's what stories do. And our collective brain at the college is just the same way. Rigid, familiar pathways. You've done this. You go to the same committee meeting and have the same conversation the same day every year. You even sit in the same chairs. That's how rigid, it's habituated. And emotion is what frees you collectively to do something different. Emotion that's real, that comes from a story like this. I grew up the child of immigrant parents who divorced when I was young in the inner cities of Miami, where violence, drugs, and gang culture is normal, and it's the way of life. And so trying to prove myself and earn the support and, and acceptance and, and respect of my friends, I began taking on that, that life that we would call that gang culture, that gang life. And doing that as a kid, I began to get arrested in and out of jail, carrying guns, and being involved in, in shootouts, being shot at and shooting back at rival gang members that by the time I was 16 years old, and not realizing what I was doing and much less appreciating what was going on, I was tried as an adult and eventually sentenced to prison for 30 years. To my credit, thankfully, and more so to my dad's credit, I, I still continue to educate myself. I got a GED and began to take a paralegal certificate program, became a law clerk trainee. And when I would look at textbooks, usually textbooks have pictures of college students. And I just dreamed of someday getting out of prison and being one of those students. And all I would think to myself, and privately to God, I would say, all I need is one chance. I would not blow this. I started fighting my case. And fortunately for me, I was able to get my sentences vacated. And my sentences were ultimately reduced down to 15 years, of which I served 12 years and four months. Many people would tell you the common cliche to stay out of trouble is to change people, places, and things. So for me to change people, places, and things meant not going back to Miami. For not going back to Miami meant becoming homeless and going somewhere where I have no one and no, no one. And the Salvation Army of Orlando responded saying they had a homeless program that would welcome me after having wrote to the local community college, Valencia College responded with the catalog and welcoming me up on my release. At that point, I thought, I will go to Orlando. I will take this risk. I will take the leap of faith. He came to our shelter, you know, looking for shelter just right out of prison. You know, kind of knew some of the stuff, what they've gone through. I've seen guys, you know, go in and out of prison. They may leave one month, three months later, they're back in. So I've seen that, so I was kind of, you know, skeptical about, Okay, is he gonna do it? This is gonna be another guy coming right back in and out. But, you know, he held true to his word and, you know, he's done a lot of good. I was so excited to be going to college. I was so excited to be out of prison. I was so excited to be doing what I had dreamt of doing so often that the day-to-day -day struggles didn't seem like struggles to me. Living in a homeless shelter, attending Valencia College, traveling on the bus, going without eating all day, worried or wondering who would I allow to become close enough to me that my story may not push away. 
If I were to hit some of the highlights throughout my journey at Valencia in the last two and a half years, I will first start off with getting a job at Valencia as a student worker. I complete my first semester with a 4.0, make the president's list, and am invited into the honor society. Then I was invited to be part of the audience when the second lady of the United States, Dr. Jill Biden, visited us here at Valencia College. And that was a big moment for me. But more importantly, when I was able to stand up and ask a question on behalf of homeless students regarding a program that we have in Florida that, are, that is not available across the country. And from that moment, I had realized the amount of support that I received for having shared my situation and for having spoken on behalf of homeless students, that afterwards I was able to meet and was embraced by the president of Valencia, who once he heard about my situation was not turned away or turned off by it, but instead embraced me for having achieved so much in spite of it. And that moment was the moment when I felt like I actually was at home. Angel, congratulations. <laughs> Valencia's latest Jack Kent Cook Scholar. When one person's will to succeed, to not go back to prison, to get ahead, is met by another person's compassionate support and willingness to reach out, amazing things happen. He defeated all odds. He defeated all odds. And he's proven to everybody that everybody deserves a second chance. And that Valencia is one of those places that gives people second chances. We cannot change where we come from, but we can definitely decide what we're gonna do and where we're gonna go. And Valencia College tells you, we don't care where you're coming from. What we care about is what you're doing today and where you're gonna go tomorrow. Yeah. You're ready to change your mind now about something. Okay? So you don't waste a story like this. There's truth in this story, not just that he had opportunity. Here's two or three. Everybody who met Angel, from the Salvation Army person to the Valencia people, everybody along the way broke some rule to serve him. You're only supposed to stay three nights at Salvation Army. He stayed a year. Okay? We admitted him without transcripts and all that stuff. Just brought him in. He's a convicted felon, and we gave him a job in the financial aid office. Broke a rule. Okay? Okay. I talked to the guys at the transportation department. They gave him a free pass on the, on the bus. I said, don't tell anybody. Okay? Everybody broke a rule along the way. What does that tell us? Okay. I live in a world where people love their rules. Really? Are you willing to rethink that? Maybe the rules are not worth worshiping. Okay? So you see what I mean? You use the story for legitimate purposes to get people to rethink the things that they take for granted. That's how you change your culture. That's how you change expectations. People don't change their minds any other way. Data, evidence even, doesn't change minds. Stories does. And then the conversation that flows from it. Be mindful of the stories you're telling. They matter. Now, we've got 10 minutes timed perfectly for you to ask maybe two, three questions, and then I'll, I want to read the poem again because I think it's timely to finish with it again. Anything? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Certainly, I appreciate the presentation. You said all that, but you didn't mention organizations like the Lumina Foundation or um, the other one escapes me. Aspen and uh, yep, the Achieving Aspen. the Dream and exactly. the Gates Foundation and 
Bob's Foundation? Well, in particular, the Aspen. I thought about Lumen and Aspen because yep. I was, had recently left Valencia when... Well, we know a couple of people affiliated with Aspen. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So how does that fit into, we're not talking about breaking any rules at this point, but in the grand scheme of things, how does Valencia align, um, how do you mesh those goals with the Lumina Foundation? We'll just leave it at that one. How do you reconcile what you're doing there with what they want to do, 6% graduation by 2025? Are you an active <laughs> participant in that or partner in that? Uh, good question. There are lots of, of good souls out there trying to work on these issues, and we don't all have exactly the same perspective on it. I work most closely with Aspen and Achieving the Dream. I have worked for years with the Gates Foundation, and, and we had a, a substantial Lumina grant early on. Lumina has refocused their attention really as a, a to state policy. Their interest is in changing the policy frameworks that they think drive institution behavior. I think that's worth doing, but I don't think um, that's, not the, that's not the first uh, direction I would go. Having worked as a senior policy advisor to a governor on education, I can tell you that the state's changes in policy seldom result in significant improvements in, in what students experience. More often the opposite. Okay? Because the state's assumptions about, about our institutions are factory assumptions. Students are raw material, we're a big factory, if they get through their product, if they don't, they're scrap. We need to reduce the scrap rate. Let's do that by standardizing everything and reducing variability and all those things you do in manufacturing. Uh, thinking that's the way they think. This, it's not likely. They think that way because they feel hopeless that we can change it. Okay? I'm still hopeful, more hopeful than ever. So I think leadership matters, culture matters, strategy matters, thinking strategically matters. If, if I have differences with any of the other players in it, they're minor, and they're mostly around this notion that best practices is the way to go, or promising practices. So there are many folks who recommend those, and we're tempted to as well. You know, you come to Valencia and say, tell me how, what you're doing, we'll show you all our stuff. But truly, just knocking that stuff off, if you're, say, from Michigan or New York, someone's here from Orange, New York. There you are, right here, wearing the orange shirt. So, so taking one of our practices and saying, Valencia does this, let's do it at SUNY Orange, would be just about as effective as digging up one of our palm trees and planting it in the front yard of the, of the community college in Orange, New York. Okay. Our work's more organic than that. That's why I spent this time to say, you got to work your garden. You can't transplant success. You got to grow it with strategy, with culture, with anthropology, with ecosystem, and with story. You got to grow your own garden. And you can. One more? Okay, end of the, yes? Or is it a series of small things that you do? The question is, are there any game changers on shaping culture, or is it just a thousand little things that you have to do? It's more the latter than the former, but I would say a couple things about it. Uh, one is, um, the leadership of the institution in ways they often don't know create the possibilities for the practice of the professionals in it. And, and so if the, the place to start is there, whatever your leadership role is, it could just be a peer leader, whatever it is, something you're doing creates the conditions of practice for other people. And if you get mindful about that and say, how can I create the best opportunity for them to do their best work? Right? Especially collaborative work. This is a team sport. This, let me say to all the faculty, we have not done you a very good service. We have restricted your practice and put administrative procedures and done things and accepted business models and things like that that we know aren't good for learning. Some of them are very hard to change because they're tied to the business model, right? But many of us, your president included, are earnestly interested in figuring out what can we change in the labor model, in the schedule, in the calendar, in the way that the materials are adopted, and in every area of practice that will allow you to do things we know are better for learning. 
And those things aren't hard to know. Okay? You, if you're not having that conversation, what's the best uh, conditions for our students' learning? Get after that. That's a great place to start. Because once, you've, once you're articulating those to each other, the change is natural then. Well, and, and here they are. There's only five variables that really matter. right? And you'll never forget these. The first is time. More time, more learning. How many ways do we waste time? And how do we get students to partner with us to spend more of their time? Time is everything. Right? Most colleges waste the first week, throw it away, with administrative foolishness, like drop ad and stuff. Idiotic. Okay? Time. Engagement. Okay? What are all the ways that we interfere with serious engagement? And what are all the ways we can support the people who are trying to create deeply engaging pedagogies? It can be as simple as telling the, the lawn guys not to mow outside the window in the middle of my class. Or, it can, or telling the facilities guys, you can hang meat in this room. Please get the temperature where people can learn. Okay? It can be simple stuff, but it's mostly more, more challenging than that. Time engagement. Assessment is at the heart of teaching. It's not an add-on. Right? The instructional process with an adult is, tell me what I'm supposed to learn. Tell me how I will know when I've learned it. I really don't care as a learner how you know. I mean, I, I want a good grade, but I'm not interested in your thought process when you assign that grade. I'm really not. Right? As a learner, I want to know how I'll know that I know. That's what assessment does, if it's done correctly. It's at the center of teaching and learning. It allows students to become autodidacts. Hmm? Time, engagement, assessment. Challenge. More rigorous is almost always better than less rigorous. They can do more. Right? They can think more deeply. Who would have given Angel a chance at a place like Yale? Guess who offered him a full ride? He's not going there. He went to UCF, graduated top of his class there, got a full ride at University of Miami to law school from Jack Cook, Kent, Kent Cook, whatever, Jack Kent Cook, a $90,000 scholarship for graduate school. Okay. What kind of a bet was that? Okay. Time, engagement, assessment, challenge. He, was, he, he rose to the challenge. And the last is heart. It means two things. They come to us with broken hearts. They don't believe they belong here. They think they're imposters. They think we're going to find them out and kick them out. They're not sure of themselves. We have to restore some confidence. Yes, you're a good learner. And many of you do that work. It's a huge, your presentation was all about that for me, Russell. But it also means one other thing, and this is difficult, uh, particularly in a peer kind of culture. In the first few seconds of every first meeting of every class, they're determining where your heart is. Why are you here? Are you here for me or are you here for you? And they, they decide and it's over. Once they've decided you're there for them, you can do anything with them. If they're not sure you're there for them, they're, they can be hard nuts. Time, engagement, assessment, challenge, and heart. What's it spell? Easy to remember, right? Mnemonic, teach. Right? You're having that conversation. What are the conditions of learning? Now you're not blaming learners, blaming teachers. You're collaborating. How do we change conditions? How do we get more time? How do we get more engagement? That's a different conversation. So I'm going to wrap to end on time, and I just want to read the poem one more time because it answers the question that everybody always has at the end of these conferences, which is, where do I start? Where do I start? And the answer is, begin the song exactly where you are. Remain within the world of which you're made. Call nothing common in the earth or air, accept it all and make it all for good.
Start with the very breath you breathe in now. This moment's pulse, this rhythm in your blood. And listen to it, ringing soft and low. Stay with the music, the words will come in time. Slow down your breathing, keep it deep and slow. Become an open singing bowl whose chime is richness rising out of emptiness and timelessness resounding into time. And when the heart is full of quietness, begin the song exactly where you are. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for hanging in there on a Thursday afternoon. I know that uh, many of you, many of us had to leave to catch flights. Dr. Shugart, again, thank you for, for taking the drive from Orlando here and spending time with us. So what did you think about the last two days? You know, working at a community college, you have to love what you're doing and love the people who come. And many of them work very diligently to walk through the threshold and see your face. And so hopefully the faces that they see are welcoming faces who value them and folks who are very proud to be working with them to help them achieve their dreams and make those generational shifts. So I'm so glad that you stayed. I'm glad that you're here. And I really want to thank Dr. Pat Renard and his team for putting together the best conference I've been to in a very, very long time. Thank you so much for that work. And for his team who, who's here, can you all stand if you're still here, just to thank you for setting everything up, taking the time to drive people to and from the airport, uh, making sure that everyone got to their places correctly. And so hopefully you have learned something that you can take home and implement. I think more than anything, I've learned a lot about myself and things that I can do as a leader in my circle. And I'm sure you've learned what you can do in your circle. Because in my book, we are all educators and we are all here to change lives. No matter what our roles are, whether you're the groundskeeper or the smile at the front door, everything that we do and say and every action that we take, it makes an impact in the, on the lives of those who come through the door, those who click online, and those who are on the phone. So I wanna thank you for joining us here today, and I hope that you had a great time. Dr. Renard, would you like to close us out? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I'll be just really brief. Uh, I think the, the common theme that I heard through all of the keynotes was uh, the question, why do we do what we do? And for me, it's courageous work. It is uh, worthy work. We certainly don't do it for the money. We do it because our students need us. They're counting on us. So I will end with a beginning in mind. I hope that you, you are able to take away one or two nuggets that you'll take back to your institution and that you will help move the needle for your institution and change one student's life at a time. So thank you for being here and have safe travels on the way home.